Well, good morning, everyone. Yeah, your car started this morning. Yeah, that's a semi miracle right there, huh? <laughs> Well, I want to welcome you this morning, and I uh, want to encourage you with some scripture as we get ready to worship God, and uh, the, the, one of my favorite, it's one of my favorite uh, promises of Jesus, we're going to talk about it a little bit later, but it's in Matthew chapter 11, uh, verses 28 to 30, and he says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Uh, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So Jesus is uh, inviting us to come to him. And what, we, what we've been talking about recently, the last couple of weeks, is that uh, anywhere else that we pursue, nothing else brings up rest for our souls except God himself. He is the source. He himself is our source. He's not even like religion. Like we're not, we're not talking about church or religion, but his presence, God's presence, is what brings rest to our souls. And so Jesus invites us actually into his presence. He says, come to me, not come to, not come to you know, religion, but come to me, a personal relationship with me, and you'll find rest for your souls. So that's what worship is all about. Every time we get together, we are coming to him. We're not coming to a religion. We're not coming to church. We're coming to, to be in the presence of God, aren't we? And that's where we find rest, rest for our souls. Now our souls, of course, uh, we have minds, wills, and emotions. How many of your minds can be racing a mile a minute, you know? And uh, we can have our minds almost hijacked by fear or by insecurities or by just something that's obsessing us at the time or worry or a problem uh, or, or stuff like that. And you know, rest for our minds would be, you know, just to be rest from all of that stuff, all that chaos and just feeling the peace of God. I think the peace in my mind would be a good il illustration of what the rest that Jesus is inviting for me, for my soul. Which says, then you'll find rest for your soul. I think that, that would include peace of mind, don't you? So I pray today that, uh, you know, as we worship, that you'll have peace of mind as you come into his presence. And, uh, you know, our emotions, how many of you know our emotions can be all over the place, right? I mean, it, it can be like cloudy and we can be like, you know, oh, I'm such a horrible day, nothing's right in my life. You know, our emotions can go up and down and all over the place. And I think rest for my emotions, uh, especially, uh, I don't know about you, but, you know, there's been times when I've dealt with like hurt or anger, or there's something bothering me, and my emotions can get get kind of stirred up. I can be angry, I can be upset, I can be, you know, just down or depressed. And rest for my emotions would be that I'd be healed from my hurt, you know. I'd be able to forgive and release anger. That I'd be able to um, just be secure in Him. And so I, I pray that if there's any unrest in your emotions today, you would feel security in God today. That you'd be able to release to Him your hurt, your pain, you know, your anger, your frustration. And you forgive other people and you just find rest for your soul, rest for your emotions, right? So I pray that uh, today we would do what Jesus said. Come to Him. Come to Him. And find rest for our souls. Does that sound like a good prescription today for our time together? So I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you made it through the cold. Let's stand together. Let's uh, worship him, uh, and I want to just congratulate, uh, uh, you know, last, this weekend we had a marriage conference, we had 54 couples come for this weekend, and uh, so we have a bunch of newlyweds among us, because we all renewed our vows, so, hey, you newlyweds, know, we're the audience right now. Yeah. Yeah. newlywed year, yeah. so you should all be excited. <laughs> All right, let's lift our hands towards heaven. Lord, we thank you that this is the day that you have made. We are worshiping you. And Jesus, we thank you for your invitation today to each and every one of us to come, to come to you. Lord, to take, take off the yoke of fear, to take off the yoke of pain, to take off the yoke of stress and worry, uh, of insecurity, of anger, to take these yokes off and come to you Take your yoke, your teaching upon ourselves, and we will have rest for our souls. Lord, in this time we spend together, we just pray for that special presence of, your, of yours to come and give us rest, to give us joy, to give us peace and wholeness, 
We're here to worship you, Lord. We, we ask for you to fill this place and fill our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning.
shout out your name from the rooftops I proclaim that I
on the, well, first of all, the Bible says that we're, we are to remember the works of the Lord. And uh, there was one day in the Old Testament that they looked back to and remember, they would tell their kids about this day was the day of the Passover. And what makes this day so absolutely incredible is the people were set free from bondage, right? And bondage for 400 years. And so the Lord said, put the blood over your door. But he also said that you were to take the lamb that you killed and you were to roast it. And 12 times in chapter 12, that's what it says, to eat the lamb. But then it says how you are to eat the lamb. And as we come to, to remember the works of the Lord this morning, because the Passover was fulfilled by Jesus on the cross. And all the blessings of the Passover that came upon them, we should expect to come upon us. And there are three. First of all, they were set free from their sin. Second of all, not one feeble person came out from among them. Not one feeble person. And then the third thing is, the Bible says they gave them, God gave them favor with the Egyptians, and they spoiled them. They came out with silver and gold. Pretty cool. Pretty cool, huh? So, so remember this. When we remember the works of Jesus on the cross, we should expect, for, for first of all, no condemnation in our life. He took away all of our sin. Second of all, he's healed us. And third, we should expect to be blessed. But this is how the Lord told them to eat. Passover. He said they were to put on their shoes, they were to gird their loins, and to, and have their staff ready. In other words, when you partake, get ready to be free. It's with anticipation that we come. Don't ever take this for granted, because every time we remember this, we're remembering the cross of Jesus and what he did for us, and all the freedom that he picked in for us. Amen? That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> So we were getting dressed for freedom. That's what I heard. We get, when we come for communion today, we are basing our freedom on the word of the Lord. Yeah. The word on uh, what God has done and what we see in the scriptures and what is true. So we're not just like hoping for some magical, you know, fairy dust to be sprinkled on us or something. I mean, we there's nothing magical about the, the elements, but they represent the power of Jesus Christ, right? Yeah. Are you dressed for freedom? Yeah. Oh man, I, I just want to share one song with you. Uh, it's an awesome song. Some of you have this memorized. I think Psalm 91. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest, will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. So today as we come, and I'm going to read some more, but we are going to come and we are going to hide ourselves in Christ. We are going to put our trust in Him as, as communion in bodies. I will say to the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely He will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. And He will cover you with His feathers and under His wings you will find refuge. And His faithfulness will be, shall be your shield and rampart. And you will not fear the terror of night nor the arrow that flies by day nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. If you make the Most High your dwelling, even the Lord, who is my refuge, then no harm will befall you. No disaster will come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. And they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. You will tread upon the lion and the cobra, that snake, the serpent, right? You will trample the great lion and the serpent. You see the analogies to our enemy? He's like a roaring lion, but he's toothless. And he's like a you know, snake. And you will trample. You will overcome because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him. For he acknowledges my name. He will call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Oh, man, you know God loves to show his salvation to us. And so let's let's come with great faith and anticipation. Just whatever is in your life uh, that is not that does not belong to you, let it go. That there's chains that need to be broken. That there's things that need to be uh, given up. Just surrender them over to God. Let's exchange 
They have darkness for his light, okay? They have death for his light. Let's just seek all that he has for us. And Jesus, we thank you that you have purchased us with your own blood. That, Lord, if we so choose to come and find refuge in you today, that we will find everything our heart really longs for. So we come to you, Jesus. We hear your invitation to come. Come to you, and we will find rest for our souls. So, Lord, we come and we thank you that you have purchased life for us, forgiveness for us, freedom for us, favor and blessing for us, and release from us, for us. And we receive now healing for us. We receive now, Lord, in your name. Amen. Uh, our restaurants are going to come forward, and if you have a gift to give or a prayer card, you're going to collect those. And if you're visiting with us or from a different church or something like that, I just want to let you know that our communion is open to, to everyone. And so we want to welcome you to come and take communion. And uh, after you take your, your elements, you can either pause to the side or you can go back to your seat and gather together and just receive communion together with family or friends, however you choose, and just connect, <coughs> connect in a personal way. With, uh, with your Lord and Savior as we do that. <laughs>
fully devoted followers of Christ. And the last couple of weeks, we've actually talked about the four pursuits of a disciple. And we talked about the first two, and today I'm going to finish with the last two. And how many of you know that there's a difference, okay, between uh, being in the stands and being on the field, right? And the best analogy I can use is that a disciple of Jesus Christ isn't someone who's a fan in the stands that says, hey, hey, you know, yeah, yeah, that's cool. But it's someone that's in the game, participating on the team, in the huddle, you know, in the middle of all the action. That's a disciple. And Jesus has called us to be disciples. That's what he's called us to do, is to follow him and to be like him. So uh, here's the four pursuits. One is uh, to memorize the master's words or his teachings. And so, I mean, you can break that down and just say, well, that just means to memorize the Bible, which I would say uh, that's that's a good thing, but that's not the heart of this part of pursuing Jesus. The real part of memorizing your master's words is a disciple would be in the presence of their rabbi or their teacher, and they would live with them and hang out with them, and they'd be listening and trying to get their words in their heart. Trying to get their words in their heart because their goal as a disciple was actually to be exactly like their rabbi. Okay? And so, how do we apply that to our lives? We are called to be disciples. And so, yes, we have a Bible. We can memorize it, and it's good to memorize it, and I try to memorize it. Uh, but also, more important than that is to get it into our heart, right? That we spend time in His presence, in the presence of Jesus. And He has a word for us. When we spend time in his presence, he speaks to us, and it's that word right there that gets written on our hearts that means something to us, and then we can go on to the second thing, and that is put it into practice. So a disciple's second pursuit is not just to get the teaching or get it on the heart, but actually put it into practice. And Jesus tells a parable about that. We talked about this last week, about a wise man and a foolish man, or a wise woman, a foolish woman, whatever. And he says, if you hear my words and put them into practice, you're wise, and it's like you're building your house on a rock, and when the storms of life come at you, and the rain, and the torrents, and the wind blows, though your house will be shaken, it will not collapse. Your life will not collapse, because you're built on me, and on my word, and your, 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 your foundation is sure. But if you hear my words, if you hear the same words, and not put them into practice, and just live according to your feelings, or your opinions, or the culture of the day, and you just build your life on whatever you want, or whatever you feel, or what you think is right, but you're not putting into practice what God says is true, then you're, you're, fool, you're a fool. Because when the storms come against you, the same storm, your house, your life is going to come crashing down because it's a false foundation. It's a false foundation. I had an uncle, and I don't really, I only met him a couple of times. And I guess my family, my on my grandma's side, we, I tell this in the first service, this is uh, a different direction, but we're hillbillies. <laughs> I found out we're hillbillies. Yeah, my grandma uh, was from Missouri, and so we a bunch of hillbillies down there that, that are my family, okay? So anyway, one time, this, my uncle, my, he was my great uncle, he was up visiting, this was many years ago when I was young, and he was a, he was a, a funny kind of guy. I mean, he had, he had somebody that was trying to steal from his general stores and consultants. He hooked up a shotgun that would go off if someone opened the door when it was locked. You know, that's kind of how he thought. I, I was like, whoa. So the sheriff had to come down and convince him that's not the right way to go. So that, I'm talking to him about that, right? So this guy's up there, and he, he wanted to share some words of wisdom with me. So I remember a conversation one time in my grandpa's living room. And he, he, was, he used to be a teacher, too. And he said, you know how to, you know how to motivate a lazy person? I said, uh, so you, just, you put a stick in their hand so short they can't lean on it. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> so I always remember that for some reason. But it leads to this. Here's my, here's my weird connection in my brain. Is, you know, whatever crutch, whatever crutch that we are leaning on for support in life, honestly, God loves you so much that he will kick that crutch out from under you until you learn to lean on him. And so that's really what you know, the bottom line is with you know, this story about the wise man and the foolish man. He's saying, you've got to completely lean on me. You've got to build your life on my word. If you do, you'll be strong. You'll be sure the same storms will hit you and hit somebody else. And you will stand because you're standing on me. And, uh, but there's, there's crutches in our lives, right? I always find myself discovering another stick that I'm leaning on. 
and and thinking, oh man, I was I was trying to get this from that, but I get it from God. And a good friend of mine, Pastor, oh, his name is uh, Father Steve Anderson. I met him several years ago. He's the Catholic priest here in town uh, at Good Shepherd, and then he moved to Holy Redeemer, the Bristol Roll. And he's a married priest. He's a crazy guy. I mean, he's like, he's, how do you have a married priest? It's pretty cool. He, somehow he got permission to become a priest after he already had a family. You know, he's only one of like four or five priests in America, in America that are married. So everybody loves him because they can talk to him about kids and you know spouses and stuff like that. But one of the things he would, he would tell me that we we used to do a Bible study together, and he would say, you know, there's this there's this ancient uh, not ancient, but there's a saint, a saint who used to say. You know, we run around and we're looking for all of these things, right? We're looking for joy. We're looking for peace. We're looking for happiness. We're looking for, you know, and so we go and we go looking for those things. And and, and we also try to fit God in there. He says, but what Jesus is really teaching us is that if we seek first Jesus, if we put him first, when we find him, we find joy, Amen. peace, purpose, healing, wholeness. And we find everything we've all, all, all been looking for. So the crutches that we lean on for security or for affirmation or for to, to, to deal with, you know, coping mechanisms, God loves you so much, he will continue to kick those things out from under you until you learn to lean on him. Because that is what uh, brings true freedom and true life to us. Okay? We don't want a false foundation. We want the real thing. Now, the last two we're going to talk about today, and uh, mostly this third one we'll talk about, and it's to imitate your master. The disciples wanted to memorize their master's words, get it in their heart, then they wanted to put it into practice, and then they wanted to be exactly like their rabbi, their master. That was their goal. And fourthly, which we'll talk about briefly, but it's kind of woven into the third one, is that they were charged with the task to go and make more disciples. Not of themselves, but of Jesus. Of Jesus, okay? So let's look at that. When when we look at this, I want to share with you a little bit of the culture of, uh, of a Jewish upbringing, okay? When a Jewish child during this time was about five or six years old, even to this day, they still do this. Um, they train their children. And so like an Orthodox, a Syrian, uh, Orthodox means, let me just say, serious. Okay? It means they are really committed to to this thing. So Orthodox Jew is a very serious Jew. <laughs> okay? I mean, they're going to do what they're going to do it. Okay? And so, in, in Orthodox uh, Judaism today, they still do this. So, ages five or six, a child would start their studies of the scripture. It's almost like their school. It's called a vet sefer. I don't know. It means house of book. House of the book. And this is the book, the Torah. So, for a Jew, they don't have the New Testament because they don't uh, believe in Jesus. Okay, so their Bible is your Bible, uh, the Old Testament part. That's their Bible. And the first five books is what they start studying. As a five or six-year-old, they start memorizing the scriptures. By the time they get nine or ten years old, they have memorized all of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The first five books of the Bible, which is a lot. It's a lot. And I cannot even imagine sitting down and trying to memorize it. Numbers! <laughs> you guys don't have a problem with that? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I love numbers. I love math. I used to be a math teacher. And I used to challenge my kids for extra credit to memorize pi, you know, as far as they could. And I still remember, like, 10 digits of pi. 3.14159265454. Check it out. Okay. <laughs> I know it's right. But uh, anyway, but the four is actually a three, but I rounded it up because the next number is a five. Matt, you might appreciate that because he likes numbers too. Okay, so they memorize, memorize, memorize. Then when they get ten, from age ten, nine, ten to age fourteen, they go to the next level. And the next level is called uh, the Bet Talmud, which is the House of Learning. So they went from the House of Book to the House of Learning. Now this is going to make sense in a, in a few minutes. That's why I'm teaching this. This, this background here. So then they start memorizing the rest of the Bible. And by the age of 14, they have the entire Old Testament that you have memorized by the age of 14. All of Isaiah, all of Jeremiah, all of the Ezekiel, all of the little minor prophets, major prophets, all the Psalms, all the Proverbs, they have all that stuff memorized. 
Matthew 2, 14. And uh, this is part of becoming a disciple. But then, uh, then at that point, is a, a major, major uh, turning point for a child's life. They're about 14. And then they go and they seek out a rabbi, and they want to be like that rabbi. Now, this is what was going on in Jesus' day as well, where they would seek out a rabbi, and they wanted to be a rabbi's disciple. Okay, that was the next step, and that was called the, uh, the Bet Midrash, or the House of Study. So they would try to get kind of enlisted by a rabbi. Okay, so they go to a rabbi and they say, Rabbi, I want to be your disciple. I think I could, I want to be your disciple. I want to learn from you. I want to take on your teaching, your philosophy, your interpretation of the scriptures. I want to be like you. And so all of that stuff, the, the, the teaching, the, the interpretation of the scriptures, uh, the way that the, the rabbi you know, thought and believed, that was called a yoke. That's what that was called, a yoke. So if you were to take on the yoke of your rabbi, you're taking on his teaching, his whole approach to everything. And you're going to take that yoke upon yourself. You were wanting to, to be that. And so they would go to a rabbi, and the rabbi then would, would uh, over the series of time, start grilling them with questions. And it was almost like they were trying to find out, well, this is exactly what it was like. They were trying to find out, do I want to accept this person as my disciple? Do they have what it takes? Will, am I going to be willing to pour all of myself into this person or, or not? And most people were rejected from that process. And they were told something kind of kind, you know. He was kind of like, you know, son, you know God's word. You've done a good job, but you can't be my disciple. So go home, learn your father's craft, and, and live your life. I mean, that basically that was kind of how they would say you're not, you're not good enough. Okay? It wasn't meant to be really a bad thing, but they did it. They only took the best of the best who became disciples. And the rest went back home, and they learned their, their family trade, and they just carried out with life. So here's the deal. Um, when a rabbi would then say you're good enough or would accept him, they would say, come follow me. That's what it would be. There's some Hebrew words. I don't remember what they are now. And they would say those words, and that would be like the greatest, I mean, the greatest moment in a child's life was to hear a rabbi say, come follow me. Because when they said that, they were saying, you can be like me. I don't know if you've ever looked up to somebody like that before. There was, I remember one person I looked up to when I was young. I had a really awesome youth pastor. And I, oh man, I, I just thought this guy was the coolest thing. I was willing to change my whole personality and everything because I wanted to be like him. Have you ever wanted to belong somewhere, you know? Do you remember junior high? <laughs> Wasn't that horrible? <laughs> Gym class. And there's time to pick teams. And you got two captains. This is the worst. This is the worst thing you can do to a junior high student, right? Because the first person that's picked to be on a team is like, oh yeah, you know, uh huh, yeah, I'm cool. <laughs> And everybody else is a loser. <laughs> right? I mean, because nobody else is first. I know you're not, but, you know, I'm saying, you know, in a junior high mindset, it's like, I remember going to school, and I had, like, back in the day, I used to have a lot of hair. You know, back in the 70s, I was in middle school, so long hair was kind of cool. And I mean, I used to comb that hair, you know. And, like, I just remember, man, it was the most important thing to me that my hair was, like, perfect. Because if it was not perfect, it was, like, you know, like the biggest embarrassment you could possibly have is if your hair wasn't perfect. So I had these big old combs back in the day. They'd stick out of your pocket and you'd walk like that. Remember that? Yeah. Big plastic combs. And then it's like, yeah, they have combs sticking out of your pocket so you'd be cool. So you fit in. And then, like, recess, you'd have comb warts. And you like, slam the two teeth out of each other's plastic combs. Remember that? Remember that? Remember that? Remember that? Did anybody else do that? Okay, three minutes. Right. Anyway. I mean, how, there's a desire in all of us, right, to belong and to fit in. And to just, we just want somebody to believe in us, someone to love us. And, and so here's, I got, I got some good news for you. Okay? Somebody loves you. And somebody really believes you. And somebody is willing to pour their whole self into you. And when Jesus came and he began to call his disciples, and you can read it right in the New Testament. He would say, come follow me. Come follow me. When he did that, it wasn't like he was just this arrogant guy walking around saying, hey, 
Yo, yo, you know. Make the fun, so I'm like, I'm cool, you gotta follow me. It wasn't like that. It was like people wanted to hear that because it was the greatest news of their life. Because the people that he was saying, come follow me, the, those guys, they were most of them were fishermen. Why were they fishermen? Because they went to a rabbi a few years ago, and the rabbi said, you're not good enough. Go home and learn your father's trade. And so they went home and they became fishermen. But here's a rabbi who comes along and says, Peter, come on, man, follow me. You can be like me, you can do what I'm going to do. And so they ran to him. Remember the disciples, they left everything to follow him? Because that's what they really wanted. That was the highest pursuit of a person's life at the time, was to be a disciple. And so Jesus, in Matthew 11, he says this to you today. He's saying this to you today, trust me. And he's saying, come to me. He's inviting you to be his disciple. He's inviting you to be just like him. And when he says that, he's believing in you. He says, you can be like me. You can do it. I'll give you some examples of that in a few minutes. But he says, come to me. And he says, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke, my teaching, my philosophy, my way of living. Take that upon yourself and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Listen, this is what we all long for. We all want rest for our souls. We want joy and peace and purpose. We want things to be in order. Uh, we want to be filled with life and hope and a future. And you can be. In him. When we take his yoke, his teaching upon us, and we apply ourselves to him, and we follow him, we follow him as a disciple. So here's the thing about religion. You know, we talk about religion versus relationship quite a bit here because it's such a big problem in our culture. So many people have been hurt or turned off by or burdened by what I would refer to as religion. Uh, the pressure to do what's right and not do what's wrong and somehow that that has some bearing upon God's love for you, God's ability to hear your prayers, or God's, God's willingness to forgive you or to heal you. Uh, or some, some bearing upon things that happen to you. But but those are all lies because the Bible says while we were yet sinners, while we were at our worst, that's when Christ demonstrated God's love for us by dying for us. So God's love obviously is not dependent upon your performance. God's, God's willingness to, to answer your prayers is not based on your performance or your, your reciprocating love for Him. He is love. That's what he does. He loves. And, and you can't get him to stop loving you. You can't. His love will con continually pursue you to the very ends of the earth. I mean, he created you to experience his love. Isn't that awesome? That's the grace of God. And so, so when we start to understand that, we understand that when he's calling us to him, he's calling us to the greatest uh, thing that we can ever do with our lives is to be like him, to be in fellowship with him. I mean, there's no higher calling on your life than to heed the calling of Jesus saying, come and follow me. That, that's the greatest. And, and anything that would uh, push back in your mind on that is probably some religion, religious baggage that you have because, because if, you, if, if I knew Jesus better, I would be running to him. You wouldn't be able to stop. You know what I mean? The more I get to know him, the more I'm drawn to him, the more I'm like, that's it, that's the answer. It's all in him. When I get to him, I find all those things I was looking for in every other place. And it's, it is true. And uh, so, you know, the idea is that religion uh, puts a yoke on us that causes us to feel shame or not good enough or striving and straining. And there's always something better. We always got to do something more. We're always screwing up. We're always not quite good enough. We didn't quite measure up there. There's somebody else who looks like they're doing better than us. God's doing something better for them. And this yoke of religion puts great pressure and burden upon us, doesn't it? But Jesus says, my yoke gives you rest. <laughs> That's a good thing. That's a good thing. And so we want to follow him. So here's a couple of things I want to share with you about, about be imitating Jesus. First of all, 
God or Jesus has authorized us in his name. He did that with his disciples. Matthew 10, 1 says he called his 12 disciples to him, gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and illness. So he gave them authority. He gave them spiritual authority. And he gives us spiritual authority. And how many of you know that Jesus is the king of all kings? He rules it all, right? In fact, before this world was, he was. The Bible says in the beginning was the word. The word was God. The word was with God. And then later it says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, which is referring to Jesus. And in him we saw all the grace and all the truth of God revealed in his life. So we know that Jesus was here long before we were here. So he's in charge of everything, right? Yeah. He has full authority because at the cross he, he took care of business and he rules and he reigns. And he's sitting on his throne right now. And he has given us his authority. Amen. So we have authority over the kingdom of darkness. We have authority on the earth to, to do what is according to his will. Not our fleshly will, but our fallen will. But his will. We have authority to do his work. He has commissioned us. The second thing is he sent us. Matthew 10, 8. He's speaking and he says, heal those who are ill. Raise the dead. Cleanse those who have leprosy. Drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. So he sends his disciples out, and he says, I'm giving you authority. Now go and do the things I've been doing. Okay? So you have been authorized by Jesus, and you have been sent. That's what he does with his disciples. His disciples aren't just there to, you know, just be little mini Jesuses walking around. They are there to do the same thing that Jesus was doing. That's why you make disciples, to repeat and to do and to copy uh, the third thing is that Jesus is in us. And I love this. Matthew 10, 40. He says, anyone who welcomes you welcomes me. But that means I'm actually sending you in my stead. Now, in this culture, if you send someone in your name, and I say, okay, I got a servant. I, I tell my servant, I need you to deliver this message or this, uh, or, or take this thing with you to so-and-so and, uh, and tell them it's me. I'm sending you in my name, Okay. And I want you to go to purchase this property, whatever. So that person would actually be literally in that culture representing that person and be representing me. In our culture, we have some stuff like that, too. It's called, uh, what is it called? Power of attorney. If we give power of attorney to someone, we are saying legally, this piece of paper, I'm signing it right now. I'm saying, now, you are me. You make decisions for me. And whatever you say, it goes because to whoever you say because you, you, you're representing me. So we have that here too. We have attorneys, we have lawyers, we have whatever, and we give power to people, and they say, "In my name, you know, go and win me some money." You know, I mean, I mean, you know, whatever. whatever it is. We, we authorize people. So Jesus say the same. In my name, in my name, wherever you go, you're going, and it's me that's going, and you're doing my work, and you have my authority, which is. Ultimate authority. So I, I always say to myself when I'm going into situations, and I'm, and I'm representing the kingdom, I, I say, Lord, I thank you that all of the kingdom of heaven is backing me up right now. Because this is all about your work. And it's not me, it's you. I think that all of heaven is behind us. All the resources of heaven are available to you when you are promoting the activity of the kingdom. Okay? And so Jesus. Is in us, and this is kind of how I would like to look up. Uh, <coughs> you guys ever seen a, uh, the Robin Williams version of Peter Pan? Remember that movie, Hook. Peter Pan? Hook. 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 Oh, it's called Hook. Yeah. Thank you, boy. Have you seen that movie? Yeah. Oh, right. I have too. <laughs> I thought I saw a different movie. That's movie. So anyway, in Peter Pan, there's a moment where there is. Uh, what is it? The, the guy goes back to whatever, Never Never Land or something, and it's, it's Robin Williams in the, in, the, in the movie, the actor. And he's there, and they're like, he's, he's Peter Pan, but he's not acting like Peter Pan. He doesn't remember he's Peter Pan. He doesn't have any of the powers that Peter Pan used to have. And in one scene in the movie, you probably remember this if you saw the movie, because it just it just hits you when it, when it happens. That little boy, that real cute little boy, grabs him, grabs his cheeks. And he squeezes his cheeks, and he's spreading his eyes out. He's looking in there, and he's looking at him, and he's, all of a sudden he gets a smile on his face. He goes, there you are, Peter. Remember that? And he sees, he sees inside, <clears throat> excuse me, he sees inside of him 
He sees Peter. And you know what? That, that is who you and I are. We, we are the sons and daughters of God. But more than that, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And you know what? We need some people around us to believe in us. Kind of play their face a little bit. Look in our eyes. And say, there you are, Jesus. You're in there. You're in there. And when we begin to understand who's in us, we, we can fly. I mean, we can, we can do stuff. Because it's not us. It's, it's Him in us. He really does want your life to impact other people's lives. He really has placed you here to be inside of you to, to communicate His love, His healing, His comfort, His compassion, His grace to a lost world. That really is what He's doing in you and through you. And it's, it's amazing, isn't it? When you've been here, I know, I know in this room uh, that some of us, we live in that land a little bit more than others. Some of us, we just visit Never Never Land, but it's a good, you know, in times, walking in the spirit, you know, aware of who we are. But when we're there, and when God is alive in us, and he does something through us, and somebody else's life has changed. Isn't that awesome? I know that you've had that experience. Because that's what God does. And sometimes it's a phone call. And sometimes it's uh, an impromptu conversation or going out of your way. Even as a student, sometimes it's just sitting next to somebody in the lunchroom or saying hi to somebody who seems down. Or, and there's so many little things. And there's big things at times that, that God allows us to do. And when, we're whisper, when we hear the whispering, hey, this, you know, Jesus in us, the Holy Spirit in us, hey, I want you to do this. Come here, come with me. Come, come with me. It's like that Peter Pan inside of you, you know? It's Jesus inside of you that wants to get out and, uh, and, and just do some amazing things. So Jesus believes in that. Now here's, here's the other thing I want to share with you. Acts 1.1. It's an interesting scripture. It starts in the book of Acts. And uh, it says, in my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach. The word began is an interesting word because the writer of the book of Acts is Luke. And Luke also wrote a gospel called Luke. <laughs> Remember Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So Luke wrote the book of Luke, which is about Jesus. And then he wrote the book of Acts. And he's referring to the book of Luke. He says, in my former book, in the book of Luke, <laughs> you know, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach. But he didn't say, and I think this is very interesting, he didn't say, in my former book, I wrote, because at the time that he wrote the book of Acts, right, Jesus had already died, was already raised to life, and already ascended to heaven. He had already spent 40 days on the earth in the resurrected body, teaching his disciples, and he ascended to heaven. He's gone. So if I would have been Luke, I probably, if I didn't have Holy Spirit, obviously, I would have said, hey, here's all the stuff I wrote about the things that Jesus did, and the things that Jesus taught. But he said, I wrote about all the things that Jesus began to do and began to teach. Why? Because he's still doing it. Right. And the book of Acts is all the acts of the Holy Spirit through the people. And the book of Acts is still being written today because you are in the book of Acts. Uh, there's a, a Bible teacher one time that said, I can summarize the book of Acts in three words. Up, down, out. Okay? Jesus went up, Holy Spirit came down, and the church went out. Yeah. And that is still happening today. Okay, The Holy Spirit is filling us, the church, and we are going out with the good news. And we get to continue to do what Jesus began to do, and we continue to teach what Jesus taught us. And so the ministry of Jesus is still alive and expanding on planet Earth today. And it's expanding through you, his church, his body. So Jesus said this in John 14, 12. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. And they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. And he's implying the Holy Spirit. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to the inside of me. John 15, 5, he also tells us, I am the vine, but the branches, if you remain in me, and I am you, 
you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So it just reminds us that it's not us being great people. It's us being willing people. Right? It's us being willing to allow God to live in us and through us. So it's not you being a great person. It's you being a submissive person to, to the work of God. You trusting in God. And he gives, he's going to do awesome things for you. So here's what Jesus did back in 423. He went throughout Galilee teaching in the synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and illness among the people. So as his disciples, we are called to preach, teach, and heal. Preach, teach, and heal. You're like, I'm not a preacher. I don't like talking in front of people. But that's fine. But you're preaching all the time. Your life is proclaiming something. People are watching you all the time. I'm here. Come on, let's have some confession here. Who, who among us are people watchers? People watchers. Yeah, okay. This, people are so interesting. I mean, that's why reality TV is so big. Because people just like watching people. Just make up something and I just want to watch people. Now I have a reason to watch people because they're on TV and I don't have to sit in the wall awkwardly staring at people. Now I can just look at them. I'm on TV. You know, now everybody think I'm weird. You know, and we learn a lot about ourselves when we start criticizing other people or we start making fun of people or we, because we're actually learning about ourselves, right? But we're people watchers. Now, you're preaching. There was a great a theologian one time that said, hey, Pre you know, preach the gospel, and if necessary, use words. And his, his whole point was, you know, people are watching us, our lives, you know, how, how things are going here, you know, the, the demeanor I have, the joy in my life, the peace, the purpose, I don't know, whatever it is, there should be like an aroma of my life, you know, because of what God is doing that speaks volumes more than my words. Because words are really cheap. We can say whatever we can say, but... You know, we can't fake a life. You know, we can't, you know what I mean? We can only do that for so long and then people see the real the real deal. And so God wants to fashion and transform your life in such a way that you really are shining, a shining star in a dark world. People are attracted to your, your life. They're attracted to your, something about you. The Bible actually says that we are the aroma of Christ. That there's something when when God is at work in our lives, there's something that people pick up on, smell, not literally, you're not supposed to really smell that. It's supposed to be a good, pleasing aroma. Okay, a pleasing aroma. And there's something that people pick up on, right? Then you can see it more in some people than others, uh, but that's my desire, is to be a pleasing aroma. And uh, if necessary, use words. But I do want to encourage you to use words. We really do in our culture now, more than ever during my lifetime, and I think the history of our country, more than ever now, we need to start using the words of Jesus. We need to speak that truth because it's not the majority anymore. And there's a lot of other words being spoken in our culture all the time, and we need to speak truth. We need to speak love. We need to speak grace. We need to be able to, to give out the hope that is within us, witness to the hope that is within us. And we really do need to use some words sometimes, you know what I mean? We gotta point people to Jesus. He's the answer that they're looking for. Even if they seem uh, angry or mean or uh, contrary to you, that they, they still need Jesus. And someone's gotta love them and then point them to him. Uh, and so that's preaching. Teaching is all of us becoming disciples. And this is going into my last point. But before I do that, healing. God wants to heal through you, uh, emotions, uh, and comfort, and just to be his hands and speak to people around you. And that's wonderful when someone has done that for you in your time of need, right? How many of you had somebody that reached out to you, just was there, brought right, peace to you or comfort, or that they actually prayed for you and you asked them to pray for you? And that's, that is a great, that's a great comfort, and it's a provision of God that that person was for you. When someone does something like that for me, uh, man, I tell you what, my, their stock in my little mind goes ding, 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 ding. You know, that's the real McCoy. That person took time out of their life to actually care about me. I mean, that's that's where you know where your real friends are, right? People start to rally around you when you need it. And they don't run or hide or ignore it. That, that's, that's really cool. Uh, so the last one is to, to make disciples of Jesus. And I'm just going to say a couple words about this. But Jesus' commission, his last words in Matthew 28, 
said, he said to his uh, disciples, after he said this, he ascended to heaven. So these are his last words. He said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go. So he's given that authority. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. So here, it's all right here. Jesus is like, now I have authority. I'm giving it to you. Now I'm sending you. And not only that, but I'm going to be with you. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to be in you. I'm going to be with you to the end of the age. I'm never going to leave you. And go and make, make disciples of the nations. And so, here's my challenge to you. I think we all should be receiving and we should be giving. We should be learning and we should be teaching. We should be growing and we should be nurturing. We all should have someone in our life that we are receiving from, being challenged by, being discipled by, being mentored by. And we should all have somebody that we are trying to pour into and be a mentor to and coach and encourage and lift up. Now, that's a given for every parent and grandparent in the room. I mean, that's just that's a no-brainer. We are doing that all the time. But even outside of our immediate family, we should be looking to mentor and build up and bring up people. And we should have other people that we are looking to for the same thing. The process of our faith is all is just uh, interwoven into relationships. The discipleship rabbi method was people intermingling in relationships and going through life together. Together. And Jesus is with you. I understand the Holy Spirit is your teacher. But you also need the rest of the provision of God, which is the church, the body of Christ. His provision to you is in the people as well. And so we need to come alongside of each other and build those kind of relationships and raise up disciples. Right? So this is who we are. We are disciples. And I hope that has been an encouragement to you. Our mission statement here at the church is we are building a fellowship of believers who know God and make him known. Who know God and make him know. And that know, that word know is not intellectual. That is experiential. That is a love know. A knowing like a husband and a wife know. Like intimate. We want to know God. We need to know God. We need to experience more and more of his love for us. And out of that flows a desire that he burst within, within us to share that love with other people. And it all flows from our relationship with Jesus. It all flows from that personal relationship with God. So I just want to encourage you guys. You did a great job. Let's go, disciples. Come on, baby. We've got a great work to do. We have a holy mission that we are on. I just want to remind you, your life is not about uh, getting out of school and getting an education so you can get a job, so you get a bunch of money to pay for all the debt that you have. So that someday you can buy a plot of land with a little box with a couple pillows in it so you can die. That is not the point of your life. I just want to be very frank. The point of your life is to know God. And they can know. You are a disciple of Jesus Christ. Your high calling in this world is to know Him and make Him known. And you do that through your job. You do that through your coaching, your teaching. You do that while you're a student. You do that on your team. You do that in everything that God has placed you in in every arena he's placed you in. You do that with every influence that you have because he's here in you to get the word out that others can know him too. We live in a broken world and are lost people and they need him. And God's plan is you. God's plan is you. It's him and you. It's Jesus and you. That's God's plan. And it's plan A and there's no plan B. It's Jesus in you. It's the hope of the world. It's the church of Jesus Christ. It's the hope of the world. So I just want to inspire you to continue to think about that. Don't get stuck down staring at the dirt here. This ball of dirt is going to be changed quite a bit. Okay? This thing's passing away. But let's keep our eyes on Jesus. Let's keep our eyes on the big picture. Amen? All right. I want to invite our worship team to come forward for a final song. Would you stand with me? I want to pray with you before they lead us in this song. Yes. Uh, this morning... Uh, I want to make sure that you have that you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. If you don't, I want to leave you a prayer to get right with God. Because all that we're talking about is being disciples of Jesus. And it starts with the commitment to receive that calling to come and follow Him. 
and uh, he is the only one through which we have forgiveness of sins that we've talked about. That Mark was saying about, about the you know the, the Passover and what Jesus did for us at the cross. He did that for each and every one of us. And so every week, you know, we like to give people an opportunity just to get right with God. I don't know where you are, but if you if you're not sure where you are, we must make sure and let's place our faith in Christ today for the forgiveness of your sins and, and come and follow him. He's a lover of your soul. He's a lover of your soul. You can have rest for your soul. Would you bow your heads with me? And I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And if you'd like to just pray this prayer and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want to know that you know that you're right with God by placing your faith in Christ. Would you just lift your hand and say, I'm praying this prayer with you. I'm going to pray with you and celebrate with you. Thank you. See your hand here. Thank you. Thank you for your hands. And let's just, let's just join those who have lifted their hands. You already who have a relationship with Christ, would you pray this prayer with us as we just celebrate uh, this decision that many people are making today? We say, Jesus, thank you that you love me. And you came to give you life so that I can have life. You came to pay for my debt of sin so I can be forgiven. So I ask for your forgiveness for all my sins. That you would cleanse me and cause me to be born again in my spirit. Breathe fresh life into me today. I choose you. I hear your calling. I say yes. Here I come. I give my life to you. I trust in you, and I ask for your Holy Spirit to fill me, to empower me, to live this life that you've called me to live. I surrender myself to you, and thank you for saving me. Thank you for writing my name in the Lamb's Book of Life, that I have security in you, and I've been called, authorized, and sent with the greatest news on the planet that Jesus loves. Thank you for loving me. In your name I pray. Amen. Lord, I just pray for those who just prayed that prayer. Lord, that you just come alongside them and fill them with overflowing joy and peace. Lord, any shackles of the past that you will begin to break those off of our lives, that you begin to cause us to walk and live in freedom, that the aroma around our life will switch from, you know, a, a, a bad odor to a pleasing aroma to you. That when others see us, they will see you in us and be drawn to you, Lord. I pray that this church will rise up to our calling as disciples and we will be filled to overflowing with your love for this world and this community and the areas that you've placed us in. God, that we will bear much fruit because we stay in your body, connected to you. We just thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy that you poured all upon us. We just pray for encouragement for each one today. Lord, that we just continue to build us up and keep our eyes focused in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, let's have a final song here. I think do this final song one. Just leave you with the Lord's blessing, okay? And, uh, and seriously, you know, I believe part of our prayer for one another uh, is the shalom of God that nothing would be missing and nothing would be broken in our lives. And we just we just continue to believe we're going to walk into that more and more, okay? That there'll be no no feeble among us. And God would just set us completely free. Just let's just keep trusting in God that has for us. Now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace, his shalom, that nothing would be broken and nothing would be missing in your life, in his name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.